Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, host of Thinking Aloud. Our topic today is the Sanskrit tradition. My guest is Dr. Dean Brown, a theoretical physicist, Sanskrit scholar, entrepreneur, and translator of the Upanishads and the Yoga Sutras. Welcome, Dean. I'm very glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I think many people who speak English don't realize that our own language, as well as most Western languages, have their origins in what is sometimes called the Proto-Indo-European language, which is really the, the, the same language from which Sanskrit and uh, the Hindu uh, traditions are derived. Yes, uh, English, uh, Russian, Icelandic, uh, French, uh, Greek uh, are all uh, dialects of uh, a mother tongue that's uh, spoken very widely in India and many parts of the world. We think of ourselves as, as being Western, and we think of India and its culture as being Eastern, but actually they, they have not only a common linguistic origin, but a, a common cultural basis as well. Yes, common thought. Uh, if we divide East and West, I would put the boundary between India and China, perhaps. But India is Western, by my way of thinking. Well, and Buddhism, which uh, was born in India and then moved to China, bridges that gap as well. So Buddhism is the West that went to the East. There we have uh, a, a, an example of uh, how we're much more intimately related to Eastern culture than we think. And uh, many, many, many words in the English language have Sanskrit origins or origins that are traceable to uh, the Sanskrit tradition and the earlier Proto-Indo-European language. Oh, yes. Most of the words in, in English, say, go back either through the Teutonic Northern European uh, uh, Icelandic uh, root to the uh, Sanskrit or the Vedic and then through the uh, Mediterranean root, the Romance root. Mm -hmm. Now we think of Sanskrit as a language of mysticism, the language of the Bhagavad Gita, of the Yoga Sutras, of the Vedas, the, the language in which there, there's the great equation, uh, Atman equals Brahman. The, let, let's start there. Maybe we can, uh, you could elaborate on that. Well, Sanskrit's an artificial language uh, spoken in the wisdom traditions and in the great hymns. The uh, language spoken in the street in ancient times would be called Vedic. Vedic is a vernacular and Sanskrit is a synthetic language. Just like the uh, Latin that Julius Caesar spoke would be vernacular, but the Latin that we have in medicine and law and botany and the church is not the street language. So Sanskrit was a, a formal language Very used formal. by the priests and by the philosophers of ancient times. Yes. Uh, and uh, it is very beautiful, but uh, it wouldn't give you much of an idea of what's actually spoken in the bazaar. But there, there's a lot of abstractions uh, that we find in Sanskrit that have permeated our, our modern idiom. Concepts like karma, concepts like Brahma. Yes, that's why we think of uh, Sanskrit as a scientific language. Mm -hmm. The terms in Sanskrit are so precise that they're used in the street today in, in California, for instance, because the English equivalents don't exist. There are many, many words in Sanskrit that describe states of consciousness. States of consciousness, thinking, mentality. Um, there are other languages that have feelings in them, but Sanskrit has precision for thought and consciousness. And metaphysics. And metaphysics, yes. And, co and, and cosmology. Itself. Now, you've translated the Upanishads very ancient and, and revered sacred texts. You uh, have described to me how these texts are really to be chanted. They're, they're like poetry in a way, and yet they have a precision to them. Could, could you read uh, one, of, uh, one of those? Yes. Uh, there are a couple hundred Upanishads uh, known today, and when the the rishis, the teachers, uh, started t 
teaching the Upanishads to the Western scholars uh, a couple hundred years ago or 150 years ago. They were very open in chanting them at first, and then they realized that if they're written down, they lose some of the power. Mm. So only about a hundred of them had been uh, written, and the rest are still in the verbal tradition. Orally the oral transmitted, tradition, memorized. Which is the origin of all wisdom, mm -hmm. is in the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. But to give you an idea of some of the melody in these yeah. documents, um, I take the beginning of the Isha Vasha Upanishad, which goes like this. Om, the sound of the universe. The sound of the universe, from which we get our modern word of human, om, humble, for that, for this. From the fall, everything has come out. Having taken everything out of it, the fall alone remains. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace. In the world whatsoever changeful is, all this with the Lord should be enveloped. By that renunciation, support yourself. Do not covet the wealth of anyone. Only for performing good deeds should one desire to live a hundred years. Only thus and in no other way will your work not have stains. It actually is in some ways reminiscent of uh, the Old Testament. Don't covet things, do good. Oh yes, the ideas are the same. There is a universal ethic. But then there's something a little deeper in there about non-attachment. Oh, yes. The ideas have many layers of meaning. They just go on and on. Uh, you can take one of these sutras and dig in it forever. Mm -hmm. The word sutra is interesting. Uh, it's the same word that we have in the hospital if you sew up a sutra. word. A sutra. A sutra means a string, a string of pearls. So these uh, ancient... Uh, Poems are uh, called sutras. They're strings of pearls. Mm -hmm. They're really like uh, They're tied together. nuggets of wisdom. Nuggets of wisdom, right. In a and that's why I read it with pauses between the lines, because each line has multiple meanings, and if you pause, it sinks into the subconscious more. Now, I think it's very interesting what you said earlier about the word human. We're all human, but very rarely do we pause to think what does that word mean and here you've traced it to a, a Sanskrit root Aum or which is the, the the eternal sound of the universe the eternal sound from which the universe is expressed mm -hmm. so everything that's in the universe is human everything that's alive is human homo sapiens among other things is human but we won't be around very long humanity will prevail long after Homo sapiens has been forgotten. And the Vedic tradition is one that has this sense of eternal cycles. Uh, Lots of time. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the Veda there are epochs of time that come and go like a big wheel. We're coming to the end of an epoch right now, which is one of the worst ones. And the we'll Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga. And we'll come up around to a better time. Yeah. If you don't like these times, hang on. Better mm -hmm. times are coming. Well, it's interesting to me, Dean. You have a, had, had a career in theoretical physics, and many theoretical physicists, such as yourself, have studied the Sanskrit tradition. Many of the great physicists have made a point of it. Yes. Physicists like the uh, Sanskrit tradition because uh, the cosmologies that were written down, uh, how the universe came about, uh, apply pretty much today. In other words, that th there's a sense amongst physicists that uh, the, the precision, the rigor, the depth of insight amongst the ancient Sanskrit uh, wise people, the rishis, uh, speaks to us today to the scientific mind. Oh, very much so. 